they didn't have to make in 1950 or 60 or 90. And so while I got what you're saying about basically police brutality, I don't think there's more than there was. I do think there is a contempt for President Obama, an ignorance about President Obama. The New York Post actually had a cartoon where they uh, depicted our president as like a monkey. Um, with the police beating him or something like that. So there has been a contempt, but I think there actually even has been a backlash to some of that contempt. So I would just suggest that even as you make a very valid point, just get some of the history so that you can put it in historical context. Do you want to intervene? Part, oh, sorry, pardon me, I, I used the wrong word. Um, I'm, I'm, I meant to say maybe intensified it. I didn't mean to like, as far as statistically, I mean like just intensified. The, the unrest that is, that's in the country. So um, so I, I think we have another, we have an answer that's going to address this too in a second. I, I just want to say one, that for me, the, 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 the real, some of the real issues here are how we do our education. So the, 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 the D.A.R.E. program, which we actually found, you know, kind of increased some, some of the issues related to, to, to drug use. The D.A.R.E. wasn't about, and it wasn't about introducing people to saying no to drugs. It, it, that's not the purpose of D.A.R.E. The purpose of D.A.R.E. was to show that police are your friends and that you need to go to police, you need to respect and do every single thing that they say. So that when we get to other parts in our life, when the police knock on our door, some people uh, open the door and say, how can I help you? And, and that, that changes a, a, a complete uh, relationship from that, from that point on. I think when I was in kindergarten, we had to go to get drinks of water, and we would stand in line, and the teacher would stand there, and, and she would say, one, two, three, as you would take your drink, and then she'd say, next. That wasn't about hydrating children, right? That wasn't about if I only wanted two seconds or five seconds of water. It was about teaching me about authority, who it is that I need to be responding to, and who I need to bow to, and who I need to do things with. Right? What, do what they tell me to do. So I think one of the issues is how we're, how we're teaching issues of authority and power, that we all have power. But, yeah. Metaphorically. No, I actually was bowing to take water out of the, the fountain. Did you want to jump in, Antonio? <laughs> then after one, this, we will get to all of our folks in line. One very panel, loquacious panel. Quick thing is that I think your question also highlights one problem we have is that we can't really measure if these encounters have increased because the federal government is not counting them. And that is something that can be fixed and I hope the Obama administration would fix that. It's actually starting to count the number of these police involved shootings and killings every year so we can measure it. Okay, so we're going to do our speed round, which will be one panelist asking every question so that we can get to everybody. Young lady, you are next. Okay, I actually had some commentary before about the gentleman oh. on Skype who said that Basically, his ideology was not all cops, not all cops station. And I think that this ideology is problematic because it isn't about the cops, it's about the system. There's an issue with the system. And I also think it's important to note in these conversations to talk about how black bodies are scripted. A lot of times in these conversations about black in America, we talk about what it, how it is that I can script my body as a black female, as a black male, to see myself more presentable. It's impossible. Because black male bodies are already have so, such hyper-masculinity and black female bodies are so sexualized. There's nothing that you can do to descript your body from racism. And I think that is something that we need to focus on. It's not whether or not cops are nice people or good people. It's about them entering training and being able to see me, not as an educated black woman that I am, but as a sexual deviant, as a black deviant. That's not gonna go away by, you know, some cops are good or some cops are bad. That's an excellent point. I'd love to hear a question. <laughs> My last commentary before I skedaddle. You're away. killing me. Seriously? You're killing me. How about a question? Come on, we've got a bunch of people in line. I'd love to be able to get to everyone. Okay. I don't have any questions. I have to oh, oh, I see. Well, thank you for your point. I thought that was an excellent point, and we appreciate it. Right over here. Go ahead, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Tell me you have a question. I definitely have a question. Thank you, sir. So uh, I'm a millennial and a first generation Haitian American, uh, recently moved back to uh, Miami. Uh, I've been to D.C., Atlanta, all across the country, and um, what I'm noticing is the uh, lack of leadership to curate uh, black culture and, uh, you know, like the art and creative culture. 
So, you know, what I'm really trying to understand from the panel's perspective is, what do you all see that systematically prevents African Americans and the Caribbean cultures from putting together more art galleries and museums preserving our culture? You know, it's interesting. I was talking to Quincy Jones about this very issue, and he said he thought it was appalling that the United States did not have a, a minister of culture. He said, when you think about how many people look to the United States and try to emulate its culture, he's like, really, we don't have a, a minister of culture who would be that individual who would be saying, here is where we would put an art gallery, and here is how we, we symbolize and show sort of these amazing artists and creators and creatives. So I think your point is, is great, and I don't certainly don't have an answer. Listen, if Quincy Jones can't solve it, God knows I can't solve it. You know, part Thank of it is access to capital. If you see these, uh, if you see these galleries as businesses, then the issue of who has access to capital becomes extremely important. While we don't have a ministry of culture, we do have a national endowment for the arts. Now the tragedy of the National Endowment is that they, if in their brains, have defined the high arts and the low arts, just as many cities do. So the high arts are the ballet, are the opera, are the classic arts. And then when you talk about black theater, uh, when you talk about African dance, when you talk about uh, diasporic um, painting, these things may or may not qualify. And so when we're talking in cities, as we've said with everything else, citizens can make a difference. You need to get on those arts commissions. You need to worry the you know what out of these people about saying you need to be more fair. In terms of this national endowment, which has been attacked by the Congress that does not appreciate arts, you know I'm not talking about all of them, um, but in terms of national endowment, we again have to talk about the political structure and who was on that endowment. But I, I think that Quincy Jones is absolutely right. We underinvest in the arts, but more importantly, we have a definition of art.